listening to a Sword of the Lord production. The message that you're about to hear is entitled, A Clear Presentation of the Gospel, by Dr. Curtis Hudson, and was recorded on Monday evening, January 16th, 1984, during the Southwest Sword of the Lord Conference on Revival and Soul Winning at Lavon Drive Baptist Church in Garland, Texas. And now, Dr. Curtis Hudson. All right, open your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, Matthew, chapter 11. I think you can find all three of those in about two or three minutes there. The rusk of those Bible leaves sounds good to a preacher's ears. As long as it doesn't last too long, he gets suspicious after a few minutes. This is a wonderful crowd, considering it's the early service, and a lot of folk have a difficult time getting off, getting home, getting dinner. We call it supper where I came from, not dinner. Dinner is what you have in the middle of the day. Breakfast is what you have in the morning. Supper is what you have at night. And lunch is something you put in a paper sack and take to school with you. <laughs> For you uneducated folk here. This is a good crowd. And I must confess, we're a little bit skeptical maybe about planning a conference this big uh, in the wintertime. And the weather frightened us because we got bad weather reports a little bit uh, north uh, east of here. And a lot of folk canceled out and didn't show up for their motel rooms they had reserved because they had bad weather reports for this area. But we're delighted to have this many here. And uh, I commend you for being here. In fact, you're a better Christian than I am. If you had been preaching, I'd have stayed at home, so I really do commend you for coming. How many here are in the full-time Christian service? You're a preacher, a missionary, evangelist? Would you stand? Would you stand? Let me see how many in full-time Christian service here tonight. Wonderful, wonderful. Good crowd. We'll recognize some of these later, and I want you to remember who you are so you can tell us a little later. All right, thank you. There's some very special people here tonight. Mrs. John R. Rice. I just saw Mrs. Rice come in over here. First Lady of the Sword of the Lord, Mrs. Rice. Greatest Christian lady I know. She and her daughter will be giving a seminar on Thursday afternoon from 2 to 4 for the ladies. And you won't want to miss that. You'll want to be there for that. So ladies, start planning now. And there'll be others coming in. And I don't mind you uh, walking around. I do mind you... Uh, getting up and walking out and not coming back. I don't mind you walking in. Used to, I worried about people who slept during my sermons. I thought that was a little rude to do such a thing, but I don't worry about that anymore. Those who sleep, trust me. <laughs> it's those who stay awake and watch me now that make me nervous. <laughs> and Brother Coleman didn't make it any easier to preach with that introduction he gave. There are three things that are nearly impossible to do. One of them is to climb a wall leaning towards you. And the second one is to kiss a girl leaning away from you. And the third one is to preach after somebody gives, gets up and gives you some kind of wonderful introduction. Always makes you nervous and fidgety. Now, I know they're hard to do because I've tried to do all three of those things. <laughs> I've often tried to kiss girls leaning away from me. I don't know why they did that. But anyway, I don't know what to preach tonight, but I want to share something with you. Romans chapter 1, beginning tonight with about verse uh, 16, and reading down several verses. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. I noticed a news article recently regarding Martin Luther, who, who would have celebrated his 500th birthday had he lived. And the Catholic Church and the Lutherans got together and discussed that maybe Martin Luther wasn't so wrong after all. That maybe we were justified by faith. But they said he believed that a man was saved by faith and the mercy of God. They didn't get it quite right. A man saved by putting his faith in Jesus Christ, trust in Christ as Savior. And that's the verse that came to Martin Luther's mind when he was climbing the so-called 39 sacred steps. Verse 18, 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They literally hold back the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They stifle the truth in unrighteousness. That word ungodliness has to do with a man's thinking. And that word unrighteousness has to do with a man's living. Ungodly thinking leads to unrighteous living. Verse 19, Because that which may be made known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And I won't read the remainder of the chapter, but I suggest you read it sometime. And now let's bow our heads for prayer, please. And our Heavenly Father, I sure wish your Son, Jesus, was here tonight. I envy those Emmaus disciples who walked with him in the way and heard him as he opened the Scriptures, beginning with Moses and all the prophets and then the Psalms, and discussed the things concerning himself. No wonder they later said, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us in the way? And Jesus, if you were here, and you could address us tonight, you know the very need of every heart in this building, and you know how to meet that need. But you are not here, and I am. And so the best I know how I yield myself for the Holy Spirit's absolute control of my life. Jesus, I would not spend the time I spent in planning this meeting just for the opportunity of preaching but I would spend 10,000 times as much time if I thought somebody could be helped in this conference, even as much as I was helped in the one in 1961. I'd never led a soul to Christ. Six years, pastor of a small church, and went out on Saturday, led my first three souls to Christ after that conference. Now, Lord, that's all we have in mind in this meeting, and I pray that you'll take the words of every speaker And may they be just the right words to do the most good for those who are present in this meeting. We trust you, Lord, to do big things for us now. In Jesus' name, amen. The Great Commission is found five times in the New Testament. It's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I think it's found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where the Bible says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The Great Commission, given clearly, Mark 16, verse 15, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, I do not know how much you can trust statistics. I sometimes wonder how they compile them. But they do make for interesting reading, and if they are near correct, it's an awesome fact that we must face. If we line all the unsaved people up in a single file, they'll circle the globe 30 times, and the line grows 20 miles every day we live. And if we could freeze the population of the world as it is tonight so no one else was born and no one else died, and we won souls at the same rate we won them last year, it would take 320 years to win the United States of America to Christ, and it would take 4,000 years to win the world to Christ. But you're not going to freeze the population of the world as it is tonight. And we can't wait 4,000 years to evangelize the world. And I'm wondering what we're going to say when we face God Almighty in judgment. And we have not evangelized our generation. I have a firm conviction that this generation of saints are going to answer to God for this generation of sinners. I'm not sure about these statistics, but I have read that 75% of the people of the world have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. They may have heard about God in some form, but they've never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. And I would add that that 75% of the world are not in heathen countries. There are some right here in America who've never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. 
If they wanted to be saved, they would not know how to be saved. And I meet people like that nearly every week of my life when I'm out witnessing. They'll say something like this, I've never understood it like that before. Nobody ever explained it like that. I can understand that. I see that. And some of those folks have been to churches right here in the United States of America. I've also read that 60% of the people of the world have never even heard the name of Jesus. Now the question comes to mind, what about all these unsaved heathen? What about these people who've never heard the gospel? When they die, do they really go to hell? With the men in Dallas, Texas, who had never heard a clear presentation of the gospel, if they die, will they go to hell? Will they stay there forever and ever and never get out? What about those in heathen countries where they've never seen a missionary, never seen a Bible, never been handed a gospel tract, never seen a television program or heard a radio broadcast? If they die without Jesus Christ, will they go to hell? And I would like to tell you no, they'd go to heaven, but since I believe the Bible, I must tell you exactly what the Bible says. And the Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You say, but they, they've never heard about Jesus Christ. God would be unfair. God would be unrighteous to let them die and go into hell and burn forever and ever. They're ignorant, and since they're ignorant, they should go to heaven. But the Bible said in Acts 17, verse 30, that God at one time winked at ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere, that means in China, that means in Russia, that means in the communist countries where no missionaries can go with the gospel. All men everywhere are commanded to repent. And if men went to heaven because they were ignorant, we're going at evangelizing the world the wrong way. The real way then to evangelize the world would be gather all preachers like this and slaughter them and burn all Bibles and destroy all colleges and seminaries and ensure that the next few generations would not hear the gospel, and thus, by virtue of ignorance, they would all go to heaven because none would hear. The Bible plainly says that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You say, that's unfair, that's unrighteous, that's unjust. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If Jesus Christ is not the only way to heaven, he's not one of the ways to heaven. Because he said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. Sometimes we're so, we're so uh, cautious, afraid we may offend somebody, and we ought to be careful. We shouldn't try to hurt people. But we must stay with the Bible. If a man leaves the Bible plan of salvation and teaches some other plan of salvation, he's leading men falsely into hell on a false hope of heaven. A man's better off to have no hope than to have a false hope. If he has no hope, he'll seek for a hope and may find the right hope, which is Christ. But if he has a false hope, he'll go through life, rock to sleep, thinking he's all right, die, and wind up in hell and thinking he's all right because he's received the seven sacraments, or he's been baptized, capsized, and simonized, or turned over a new leaf. And he's kept all the rituals and burned the candle, so I'm all right. I'm sincere. No, sincerity is not a savior. What about these unsaved heathen? There's billions of them. All of them that died in generations past, and all that will die in generations to come before our Lord returns. What about them? Suppose they were in a huge courtroom and the most brilliant lawyer that ever lived came. And he represented all these unsaved folks who had never heard the Bible, never seen a gospel tract, never seen a missionary, never seen a television program. And he said, Your Honor, if these people die and go to hell, you'll be an unjust and an unfair God. And he pleads his case. And when he finishes, the apostle Paul becomes a prosecuting attorney. And Paul steps up before God and says, Your Honor, I, 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 I beg to differ with this fellow. I say that you'd be an unrighteous God if you didn't send them to hell. And you'd be an unjust God if you did, did not send them to hell because all men have some light and all men are without excuse. And Paul calls two witnesses to the stand. I have four propositions tonight. I'll give them to you within 30 minutes and stop. Proposition number one, all men have some light. John chapter 1 verse 9, He was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. 
And Paul calls two witnesses to the stand. First, Paul calls a witness of creation. And he says in verse 19 and 20, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Paul is saying these men may have never heard the gospel, they may have never seen a missionary, they have never seen a gospel tract, but they have seen creation. And creation said to every man, there must be a creator. I must tell you, if I'd never seen a Bible, or if I'd never been to a college or a seminary, I would believe in a supreme being. I may not know his name. I may not know the various names of God and the compound names, but I would believe that somebody had to create the things that exist. Creation is the outward visible witness that there is a creator, and every man has that light. Creation shows the power of God, there's glory all around, and those who see must stand in awe, for miracles abound. I am not an evolutionist. I'm sorry, I'm not an evolutionist. And if you are an evolutionist, don't come argue me about it after the service. You know more about your kin folks than I do. Some of mine may have hung by the neck, but none of them ever hung by the tail, I can guarantee you that. This business, once I was a tadpole long and thin, then I was a bullfrog with my tail tucked in, then I was a monkey hanging from a tree, and I'm a professor with a Ph.D., I can't buy that monkey tail. The Bible only gives one half verse to atheism, and that's found in Psalm 14, verse 1, where it says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Man wants to get rid of God because he knows that if there is a God, he must face him. And since he feels uncomfortable with God, he tries to explain away God. And unless he believes in the Genesis account of creation, he must believe in evolution. There's no other way to go. And, and he'd rather believe in evolution than admit the fact there is a God because he feels uncomfortable that one day he must face God in judgment. So he tries to get rid of God. But trying to get rid of God is like the fellow trying to throw away his old boomerang after he bought a new one. He killed himself trying to throw the old one away. Because every time you throw God out, he comes back, and he keeps coming 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 back. You can't get rid of God. He's everywhere. little fellow on a train was talking about Jesus, and the skeptical conductor said, Son, if you'll tell me where God is, I'll give you a big red apple. And he came back by in a few minutes and said, Well, son, have you thought about that? He said, Yes, sir, I have. He said, Well, tell me where God is. I'll give you a big red apple. He said, You tell me where God ain't, and I'll give you a whole bushel of big red apples. God's everywhere. Come on. Men have the outward visible witness of creation. And Paul says in verse 20, For the invisible things from him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And he goes on to say, So that they are without excuse. Suppose I held this watch up here tonight, and somebody said, Where did you get it? And I began to explain the process of evolution, how it evolved. And I told you after so many millions of years, it evolved, and this little flat object and all these little springs in the back evolved. And all these little wheels and cogs, various sizes, all fitting each other, evolved. And after a number of millions of years, two little hands evolved on the front, one shorter than the other. That's the hour hand. Evolution made good provisions. And the long hand's the minute hand, and, but neither hand was too long so they couldn't uh, fit on the face. They didn't go off the face of the watch. And then the sun shined real hot and started a fire, and the fire got so hot, hot the sand melted and created glass, and a bubble come on the top and I had a, a glass crystal across the top. You're already laughing at my story. But I went on to say after a few million years, a lizard came by and hung his tail on one side and stripped the whole side of his tail off. Now I sound kind of crazy, don't I? Well, you go to a high school biology class, you get things crazier than that. Now, come on, man. You're welcome. Wake up. Can't believe that. I've got to hurry. I won't finish this. Paul said they have the outward visible witness of creation, but number two, he said they have the invisible witness of conscience. Look at chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, quickly. For when the Gentiles which have not the law are the word, the Bible, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a 
law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing them witness. Now listen, and you must be honest with yourself. You must tell me without, without opening your mouth, but you would have to admit that somewhere in your life as a little boy, as a little girl, something inside told you there was a God. You didn't understand it, but something inside said there's a God. Long before I ever heard a sermon about Jesus dying on the cross, my little boy heart told me there was a God, that God was real. And if anybody told me there wasn't a God, I'd have cried, I'd have fought him over God, over the existence of God, because something inside said to me there is a God. I didn't understand the plan of salvation. I didn't know justification, sanctification, imputation, regeneration, glorification. I didn't know anything about the doctrine of salvation at all. But my heart told me there was a God. And in every little child's heart, there, there is a belief that there is a God and no, no children are born atheists. They never become an atheist till they're tampered with, their minds are tampered with in a high school biology class or a college or a seminary somewhere. And then they come back being an atheist. But they weren't born atheists. There are no atheists born. They had to be taught to be atheists. And every man's heart tells him there's a God. A fellow stood in a drugstore, and I witnessed him. He said, I don't believe there's a God. I said, you're not serious. Yes, I'm serious. I don't believe there's a God. I said, you're not serious. He said, I'm serious. I don't believe there's a God. I said, you couldn't be. He said, I'm serious. I'm serious. Less than three months later, an automobile was driving very fast in front of me and turned a sharp curve, overturned, flipped over a barbed wire fence into a pasture. A man was thrown out, and there was lying on his back, and I stopped and ran over to where the man was, and it happened to be the fellow that I'd witnessed to in the drugstore about three months earlier. The man had said over and over, I don't believe there's a God, but he was laying there on his back and, and his mouth, the blood was coming out of his mouth, and his dentures had come out of his mouth, and he was mumbling underneath his breath, Oh God, help me. Oh God, help me. Maybe it's his subconscious mind, but his conscience told him there was a God. And so Paul says, Your Honor, these men are without excuse because they have the outward visible witness of creation, and they have the inward visible witness of conscience. But here's the question. Is the light of conscience and the light of creation enough for a man to be saved? The answer is no. The Bible never says, Believe in creation and thou shalt be saved. The Bible never says, Follow your conscience and thou shalt be saved. A conscience cannot be followed unless it's properly educated. The Catholic's conscience bothers him if he doesn't go to Mass. I never have been to Mass, and my conscience doesn't bother me at all. It's the difference in our education. Come on. You must properly educate the conscience. The Bible nowhere says follow your conscience. The light of creation, the light of conscience is not enough. A man cannot go out in the woods or the mountains and, the, and look up and see the, see the mountains and the trees and the sunset and say, I, I believe there must be a God. and Go to heaven. He won't go to heaven like that. The Bible never says believe and be saved. The Bible always identifies the object of faith. It is always believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. But I left out two words. What I leave out. A little more volume on this. I left out the two words in him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. You'll never find the Bible saying, Believe and be saved, believe and be saved. But it's careful to say, He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned, but he that believeth not on the Son is condemned already. It's always you must believe in Christ, trust Christ, depend on Christ, rely on Christ. Well, since the light of conscience and the light of creation is not enough for a man to be saved, then how would God be a just God if he sent men to hell who only had that much light? And so the second proposition is that light obeyed increases light. I'll give you two Bible examples, and that's all tonight, without any other experiences. The Bible's a good commentary on the Bible. In Acts chapter 8, you have the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Was he a religious man? Absolutely, he's a religious man. Was he a good man? Yes, he was a good man. Was he an honest man? Yes. Was he a, was he a trustworthy man? Yes. He was a treasure for the queen. He had charge of all that she had. All the money was in his charge. 
He had the light of conscience. He had the light of creation. He knew there was a God, and following the light that he had, he went to church. He went to church to worship. He did not know what he was worshiping, but he went to church to worship. But he was lost, right or wrong. He's on his way to hell. I've heard Dr. Rice preach a sermon on a good man lost and a bad man saved. And he used this man, good man, good man, but he's lost. Why? He hasn't trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. But he at least is following the light that he has. He's not a fool. His mind is not filled with vain imaginations. He's not saying there is no God. He at least admits there's a God, though he doesn't know him as Savior, and he goes to church. And on the way home from church, he has his Bible up on his lap, and he's reading. Unusual thing. He has his Bible open to Isaiah chapter 53. Who told him to open the Bible to Isaiah chapter 53? Isaiah 53 has 12 verses in it. It has 12 mentions of the substitutionary death of Jesus. Martin Luther said of Isaiah 53, It is so precious it should be written on parchment of gold and lettered with diamonds. I have counted 85 references to Isaiah 53 in my New Testament. There may be more. I've counted that many. Here is what he is reading. Verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Here's what he's reading. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and Jehovah the Lord hath laid on him Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He's reading the John 3 chapter of the Old Testament. But he doesn't know who the he and the him is. But God's giving him more light as he rides along in his chariot because he's obeyed the light that he has. But he doesn't have enough light yet, so God says to an evangelist named Philip, I want you to leave this revival meeting and go down to a certain desert. There'll be a man riding a chariot. Climb up in the chariot with him. Because he's obeying the light he has, God sends a personal soul winner in the form of an evangelist all the way to the desert to witness to him. And so he climbs up in the chariot with the fellow. And like a good soul winner, he has a good opening. He says to him, Understandest thou what thou readest? Acts 8.30. And the eunuch said in verse 31, How can I accept some man should guide me? And then he asked Philip this question, Of whom speak the prophet these things, of himself or some other man? And the Bible said Philip began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now he's getting more light. That's verse 31. In verse 36, they passed a pool of water. And he said, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? He's getting more light. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they stopped the chariot and Philip baptized him. And the chapter ends with Philip being called away and the eunuch going his way rejoicing. He got light and light and light until he got the clear plan of salvation. And he trusted Christ as Savior and got more light and obeyed Christ and got baptized. If the chapter had continued, he'd have asked for a set of tithing envelopes in a few more minutes. Because he's obeying the light he got. But that's not an isolated incident. And two chapters later, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is a devout man who prays to God always. I've often wondered about that. He prays all the time to God continually, and yet he's lost. If he dies, he's going to hell. He'll burn forever and ever and ever. But he's a devout man, a religious man, good man. But he's lost. But he's doing all he knows to do. He's praying. I don't know what he's praying. don't know what he's asking for. But he's praying to God always. He's obeying the light that he's gotten. So God spoke to uh, 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 Apostle Peter, a preacher, and said, I want you to go to Cornelius' house and tell him what, what he must do to be saved. And Peter said, Lord, I can't go over there. That's not the kind of crowd I preach to. And the Lord gave Peter a vision with unclean animals come down out of heaven in a sheet. And then he said, What I have cleansed, call thou not common and unclean. You go preach to him. Now I want you to see something right here. God had a much more difficult time getting that, uh, the apostle Peter to go tell him how to get saved than he did getting the guy saved after he got Peter over there. And I'm going to tell you something. I want you to learn this conference right now. The problem is never with the harvest. And don't go back and say, well, my area is hard. No, the problem in Cornelius' case was not that Cornelius was hard to get saved. It was it was hard to get Peter to go tell him how to get saved. And the big job today is getting preachers to get off their blessed assurance and go tell folks how to get saved. 
If the average businessman worked no harder than the average preacher, he'd be bankrupt in three weeks' time. You're welcome. God gave him light. He got saved. I must stop because i got to go on. I mean, I must stop with that point. i got ten more minutes. Forty more minutes of preaching. Third proposition, light disobeyed increases darkness, and this frightens me. And his heart was darkened. Truth is dangerous. Truth cannot be put in a bank vault and locked up. Truth cannot be iced down. You see, every, every, every person in this building tonight, every preacher, every layman here is responsible for the truth you are hearing right now, but you're also responsible for the truth you could have been hearing had you been listening. And light disobeyed increases darkness. Let me show you what I think is a very terrifying verse in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It's verse, verse 10 and 11. First part of verse 12. If I did not see this with my own eyes, I don't know whether or not I'd believe this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, now watch the verses carefully, and them that perish because. They perish because. Now watch this. We'll tell you why they perish. And them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. They didn't accept the light they had. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. They had truth or light, but would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For that cause, the Bible said, with all deceivableness, unrighteous in them that perish, they perish because they received not the love of the truth or would not walk in the light they had that they might be saved. Now watch verse 11. This is the one that's hard to believe. For this cause, what cause? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. Now I know the devil sends us delusions and blinds our minds, but here's God sending men a strong delusion, but it gets worse. Why would God send men a strong delusion? Look at the rest of the verse. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God wants men to believe a lie. That's what it says. Why does God send men a strong delusion that they'll believe a lie? Read the rest of it. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's almost like God says, okay, I gave you light, I gave you light, I gave you light. You wouldn't accept the light you had. You wouldn't obey the light you had. And you want to go to hell, so I'll give you a little shove. I'll send you a delusion that you'll believe a lie that you might be damned. That's hard to believe, but there it is. Now watch something else here with me, please. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Truth is never traded for error. Truth is traded for unrighteousness. When a man rejects the truth, he adopts unrighteousness. Who would have ever thought that the Methodist church, and we probably have Methodist preachers here tonight, but who would have ever thought if they read the uh, diary and all the works of John Wesley, who would have ever thought the Methodist church would have got to where it is now? Where now, in the Methodist church, there's a homosexual caucus who are wanting to change the rules and regulations of the Methodist church regarding sexual behavior. And they want the rules to state that all sexual expression is affirmed by the Methodist Church as long as it's done in a loving relationship. And what they want by that is all sexual expression. That means incest is affirmed by the Methodist Church if it's done in a loving relationship. Now, I hope the homosexuals don't get their way. That's what they want. But who would have ever thought the Methodist Church would have tolerated a caucus in it like that? I can't imagine the South Wide Baptist Fellowship meeting together with a caucus of a hundred homosexuals wanting to run the South Wide Baptist Fellowship. Come on now, talk to me. I guarantee you, I'd be one that wouldn't stay around there very long if they stayed. Now, I'd be from sitting down behaving yourself, listening to the gospel and trying to get saved, but trying to change the rules of the Methodist Church to read. Now, who would have thought the Methodist Church would have ever gotten that far away from God? So they'd even sit down and talk with the crowd like that. They didn't start there. They first started off by denying the virgin birth of Christ. And when they rejected the truth, God darkened their minds. And every time you reject truth, 
more darkness comes and more truth rejected, more darkness comes, and I'm frightened to death. I don't know much, but what little I do know, I'm afraid I know too much. Because the guy that knows something and won't obey what he has, does not walk in the light he has, that light turns to darkness. And a man chooses unrighteousness and trades away the truth. I'll give you an illustration. A man comes back here and sits in the back of the church. Next month is stewardship month here, in emphasis month. And let's suppose he comes one Sunday morning and he hadn't been to church in about a year and Gary Coleman gets up and preaches on the tithe is the Lord. Is that the truth? And Gary not only says the tithe is the Lord's, but the first 10% belongs to God. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all thine increase. Is that truth? Pay your tithe before you pay your car note, house note, television note, or before you pay your power bill or gas bill. Cut your tithe off the top. Come on, talk to me. Got enough sense to know if you left him to the last, you'd spend it all. Somebody said, should I tithe if I begrudge it? I said, absolutely. That way you only commit one sin, the sin of begrudging. If you don't tithe, you commit two sins, the sin of begrudging, the sin of stealing. Now give. One guy in Atlanta uh, told of a man who's had a member of the church, had, a, had inherited a million dollars. The lawyer went to see the pastor and said, Oh, Bob's inherited a million dollars, but I'm afraid to tell him he's got heart trouble. I'm afraid the shock will kill him. He said, The pastor, you know how to break that kind of news. You go tell him. So the pastor went to see Bob and said, Bob, if you suddenly inherited a million dollars, what would you do with it? He said, I'd give the church half of it. And the preacher had a heart attack and died. <laughs> Most of them would. But here's a guy back here, and Brother Coleman preached on the tithe is the Lord. Honor the Lord, the first fruits of all that. And he gets madder and madder and madder. And he says, every time I come to the church, it's money, money, money. That's all I hear. Don't want money, 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 money. And he gets so mad, his face turns red. And he starts foaming at the mouth, and he nudges his wife and says, I'm never coming back here. He rejected the truth that the tithe is the Lord's. So he goes home, and about four Sunday mornings later, he's sitting there in front of the television set. And somebody knocks on his front door. He opens it. There's two men, nice suits on. And one of them pleasantly says, Have you heard there is no hell? Is that a lie? Come on, talk to me. He said, No, I hadn't heard it, but I like what I hear. Come on in. And so they leave him with their watchtower. I didn't mean to tell who it was. I won't tell you who it is, but the initials are Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyway... There is no hell. A loving God won't let a man burn forever and ever in hell. A loving God won't do that. No God would ever, in the world would ever let a man burn forever. There's no hell. He likes what he hears, so he believes the lie that there's no hell. Now, he, he rejected the truth that the tithe is the Lord's for the unrighteousness of his greed, and God sent him a lie there is no hell. He believes, and when he dies, where is he going? He's going to hell. I'm looking at preachers right now that know the truth about some things, but you won't do anything about it. You'd be better off not to know it. Light, incre light obeyed increases light, and light disobeyed increases darkness. When we know what's truth, we can't worry about what folks think. Come on. If it bankrupts hell, we must speak the truth. You know, talk to me. You say, Grandma didn't believe it. That's Grandma's problem. Tell it like it is. If you know something, stand on it. If it's the truth, stand on it. The fellow who knows truth but holds back truth practices unrighteousness because he holds the truth in unrighteousness. Give you one more proposition. I won't, I won't even finish it. But all men, the final analysis, will be judged by the light they received. Very quickly, without any comment, just brief comment maybe, Matthew 11, verse 20 and 21, 22. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. He scolded them because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Our Lord not only knew who did repent, but he knew who would have repented had they had the opportunity. And he says in verse 22, But I say unto you, that is uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida, 
I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sodom at the day of judgment than for you. Why? That word more tolerable means they'll come out better in the judgment than you will. Now, I'm not here to preach to someone on the white throne judgment and talk about the degrees of punishment and why and how. I'm just saying that some will come out better at judgment than others, and those that come out better at judgment will, those who ha will be those who had the least light. If I had to die and go to hell, I wouldn't want to die and go to hell from America. I want to die and go to hell from some heathen country where the gospel had never been preached. But they'd never seen a missionary, they'd never seen a Bible, they'd never seen a gospel tract. And I'm going to shock you with this. If a man is going to die and go to hell, the sooner he dies and goes to hell, the better off he'll be. Because every day he lives and receives more light, the more severe his judgment will be at the white throne judgment. All men have some light. Light obeyed increases light. Light disobeyed increases darkness. And the final analysis, men will be judged according to the light they've received. Where little is given, little is required. Where much is given, much is required. I want you to stand quietly together, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one moving. And now, Heavenly Father, we're going to receive some light here this week. Maybe we'll re be reminded of some light we already have. I think I spoke to some people right now that know some things they ought to be doing they're not doing. And I think I probably spoke to some people who are doing things they know they ought not to be doing. They know what the Bible teaches. They have the light of the Scriptures. And not to obey that light ensures that darkness will be increased. And I pray that you'll burden our hearts with this sermon not only to get more light during this conference, but to go back home determined that we're going to obey the light we have, lest our darkness be increased. It frightens me when I see men take a firm stand, and then a little later down the road say, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. What's happening is darkness is coming. We rejected a truth back there somewhere. Help us to be honest, to be sweet, to be spirit-filled. Be honest with the Bible, be honest with ourselves. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking. I want the audience to play something very softly. I have a question for you. Don't raise your hand or ask the preachers first. This is the first service. And we'll have a great lineup of speakers this week. But I wonder how many preachers here would say, I, I have some light on some things, but I'm not practicing it. I know some things I ought to be doing, I'm not doing in my ministry. I don't lie about it. How many preachers say, I know some things in my ministry I ought to be doing, I'm not doing. Raise your hand real high and let me see it. Some light I'm not obeying. Keep your hands up real high. Balcony, main floor, everywhere. Beautiful, wonderful, thank you. How many laymen would join these preachers and say, Dr. and I have some light on some things. I know I ought to be tithing. I'm not tithing. I know the truth of the Bible. The tithe is the Lord's. But somehow I never got around to it. Or I know I ought to be winning souls. But somehow I never got around to it. Or I know I ought to be reading my Bible through every year at least and spending some time in prayer every day of my life, but I'm not doing it. Or maybe you're thinking you're doing some things that you know better than doing. You have light on it. You know it's wrong, but you're doing it. How many would say to me, Dr. Hudson, I have some light on some things that I'm not obeying. But I promise you and promise God that when I leave this building and this conference, I'll work at obeying and the light I have. Raise your hand real high and let me see it. I know I have some light. I'm not obeying, but I promise you and God I'll obey it when I leave this conference. Thank you. And if I'd ask you to come forward, you'd have filled the altar area up and the aisles up, but I won't do it in this first service. We don't give invitations usually in the first service. And our Heavenly Father used this sermon printed indelibly on the wall of our memory. Remind us often of the truths we know. And remind us of how awesome it is to hold truth. We pray you have been blessed by the message you've just heard. The Sword of the Lord has many helpful materials available for purchase. For a free catalog, please call 1-800-251-4100. 
or you may reach us on the web at swordofthelord.com. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you.